Uh, and then we have my father. I'll explain a little bit. It's difficult to hold this up, but the, f the one in the front row in the middle is Charles Spofford, uh, a very close friend of my father's, and I, I really like Charles Spofford a lot. He ended up being uh, the legal counsel from Davis Polk, Wardwell, Sunderland, and Kendall, to, for the Suez Canal Company and many, many other uh, high, high positions. He rose to the top, getting all sorts of honorary medals from foreign governments in Europe and everywhere and uh, Council on Foreign Relations and uh, a lawyer and a very, very decent, nice man. He close to my father. Uh, he died about 25 years ago, I guess. He, interesting man. He was born in, Connecticut, in uh, California, I believe. And unlike the re other Bones uh, characters that were in that class, friends of my father's, uh, he had not been to prep school, one of the fancy prep schools on the East Coast. He, he went to public school in California which I do believe they must have had extremely good public schools back then because Chuck Spofford was quite a scholar and he was a, a very good musician. And uh, very high up he became after World War II, which he served in in Europe uh, as a lieutenant or something. After he got out, he was promoted way high up to a, one of the top positions in NATO, the North American Treaty Organization, and went on to be very influential in diplomatic circles. Uh, this is coming from being a boy in the public school system uh, in California, uh, rising to just really the highest heights imaginable. So that's Chuck. The other members that are, list are shown there are uh, close friends of my father's, Rebel McCallum and uh, Fred Haynes, I think. I'm not going to tell you where they all are. My father is in the picture somewhere there in the second row, I think. And Edwin Blair, who uh, was called Mr. Yale always because he, uh, his, uh, he uh, was a great fundraiser for Yale. Um, so he was Mr. Yale. He was also the uh, gentleman that... Uh, invited my dad to go out to Bohemian Grove for uh, one week or whatever it was. Uh, that It was through Edwin Blair that my father did go out there, and he, when he returned, you know, he, uh, he wasn't terribly impressed with what was going on there. He said the food was excellent, the lectures were pretty good, uh, everything was done very nicely, but he would never go back. Uh, so I'm making excuses for my dad because I don't think he was ever really... Um, very happy with the agenda, the Yale agenda, the orders agenda, although he stayed close to his friends, as you can see in this picture. They're all having a very good time on someone's boat or on the dock somewhere. This is the Skull and Bones grandfather clock. These clocks were given to members of the order when they got married. And my father uh, was married in 1927, I believe, and uh, he, he ordered the clock from a clockmaker in South Carolina, and the, I think that the order paid, pays for the clock. And uh, it was a gift, and all of them receive a, a clock when they get married. I believe that's the case. And uh, we had it in our house from the time I was born, of course. And I remember it best because it's so mellow. And I would, as a young child, you know, waiting for Santa Claus to arrive, go to bed at night, and the clock would, you know, go off at every hour. And my mom and dad, of course, were putting things under the tree and giving Santa Claus his, his peanut butter sandwich and banana. And I was sleeping and listening to the clock. And then finally around, you know, five, it would strike five, then six. And I'd know, well, I, am, I can get up now. And I'd run down, and Santa Claus had been there, and the sandwich had been eaten, and the clock would strike 6.30, and then everybody would have to come down and deal with me. So I, I just have great memories of the clock. And what, what the significance is with the clock, uh, Dad used to always say, he was very firm about that. He never told us why, but don't ever let the clock wind down. Keep the clock wound sharp. And uh, always keep it five minutes ahead. 
And what that means, maybe it means they're five minutes ahead of everybody. The order has to keep five minutes ahead of all of us. Uh, and don't let it wind down because if you did that, they'd be getting five or ten minutes behind or more. And as a member of the family, you're, you never talk about the order. My father never discussed anything about, about the order of any significance, really. Uh, although, as, as we said earlier on, he very, most of his friends were very close. Uh, very close friends were the order and all of them, all the ushers in his wedding, were skull and bones. Uh, the order and friends all the way through life uh, but that had nothing to do with his own personal beliefs and all he he, he did not uh, he was not involved in any major um, political decisions affecting our country or our schools or anything he was a wonderful mayor of several towns a very strict constitutionalist which certainly doesn't go along with what the order stands for I mean, he would really cause trouble on the board if anybody deviated from the Constitution. So that's just a little bit of a defense of, of a member of the order, my dad. And uh, as you heard earlier on, you know, before he died, he, he did say that uh, he would help me if he could, if he had longer, right? So uh, hopefully there are more members who've come to that conclusion. And maybe someday we won't have a problem with the order. I hope that the order doesn't continue causing all of us the problems that it's caused in the past, though, especially in education. Now, uh, we're going to get into the books. The books are... Books were originally... They'd never published the list of members in book form before. At least that's what my father told me. One day when he was ill, this is the catalog of the membership of living members, volume one, I think it's around 1978, This, the date on this. Well, that one's 1977. Let's take a look at this. Uh, oh no, see, this is October 1983. This is what happened. A dad, I was taking care of my father. He was dying of cancer in New Jersey, and my sister and I would rotate, go down there. We didn't want to put him in a nursing home. So uh, one day, it was pretty close to the end of his life, uh, the mail brought these two books in the mail, which are, one is this one, Volume 1, The Living Members, the catalog of the living members as of 1983. And this is the catalog of all the members as of May 1977. This is the living and the dead. As of May 1977. So this is really the updated one right here. Anyway, I was opening the mail because my father wasn't well. I was taking care of all the business things and mail correspondence and and these arrived, and so I took them into Dad, and he said, "Boy, he said, they're getting pretty fancy up there in New Haven. You know, he said, what are they doing? Uh, never been in book form before. And that was his little comment. And so I said, well, it, it is, you know. So uh, we, uh, around that time, I was working with Anthony Sutton on something, because I was always very interested in U.S. policy towards the Soviet Union, and he was, had done such remarkable work, aside from his great book, which came out subsequently on the order, but his work at the Hoover Institute uh, in regard to United States uh, transfer of technology and all sorts of uh, information uh, and money, etc., to the Soviet Union from the time of the uh, Bolshevik Revolution. And so Sutton was very highly respected in that field. And, and he, he told me, we, it just was a fluke really, that he happened to call right at the time when the books had arrived because he said he couldn't understand what it was all about. And I said, well, you may be interested, I think, you know, in, in the order at Yale. And uh, he said, I am. He, he said, I am interested in that. He said, I... I don't understand the connection, and I, I told him that I had the lists. 